When I was in sixth grade one day, over eight years ago, my friend pulled me over to a computer in the middle of woodshop class and said, you wanna watch Ed's World? I had no idea what Ed's World was, but then he showed me a few episodes, and ever since then, I was hooked. In the years since I was introduced to this web series, I started drawing comics, I'm making an Ed's World movie, and I even got to work on the show. If I had known that this simple little web cartoon about a group of friends who go on various misadventures would give me the opportunity to do all these things, my head probably would have exploded. But I'm only mentioning this because I'm not the only person that Ed's World was a massive influence on. For over 13 years, thousands and millions of people around the world fell in love with this show, and they're all practically why the show has lasted so long. The show just oozes charm, through the animation, the characters, and its sense of humor. There's no other way to describe it than, it's Ed's World. So to pay my respects to this show, I'm going to give a review on each episode by posting a new video every single day. I'm not going to do the shorts or the music videos or anything like that, I'm just going to do the main ones. And keep in mind, the thoughts I express in these videos don't represent the opinions of everyone on the crew. These are all just my personal opinions, and this is more of a way for me to share them with my fellow Edheads. Also, this won't get in the way of the Pretty Swell podcast, those will still go up every Friday. So, get ready as we begin a new series I like to call, Ed's World Recap. Let's start with the first official Ed's World episode ever made, the 2004 Christmas Special. This was the one that started it all, and it clearly shows. Look at the animation, listen to those voices. Nothing. We'll never get this Christmas special finished. Look at how Tom is shooting coal out of an Uzi at members of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh dear. This was certainly a far cry from what Ed's World is like nowadays, but things like the plot remain just as equally simple. Tom forgets to take the firewood out of the fireplace, so when Santa comes down the chimney, he breaks his leg. Wait, is Tom really the only person in the world to forget about removing the firewood from the fireplace? No other person or family in the world forgot to do it for their homes? Is this just Santa's first stop? Am I just overanalyzing? Maybe. Well, now it's up to Ed, Tom, and Tord to finish delivering the rest of the presents and save Christmas. Where's Matt during all this? Probably asleep. I don't know, he wasn't really considered a main character at this point, so, yeah. It's gonna be pretty hard to critique these older episodes because Ed really just made them for fun and didn't put a whole lot of effort into them. So things like the story and the animation are gonna be a bit crude. Then again, the story is at least simple. It's easy to understand and it doesn't trail off to a point where it gets cluttered or confusing. There are, however, a few quirky moments, like this one. Oh, crap! We are so busy delivering the other's presents that we forgot to deliver our own. Uh, I don't think you have to worry about that. We saw Santa come to your house. I'm pretty sure he already delivered your presents, even if he did break his leg. I can't really criticize the animation because this came out over 13 years ago, when Ed was still just a kid. I will say, for the time, this probably looked great. And for episodes like this, I think the animation kind of adds to the humor, so I guess you could say it's passable. I do find the speech bubbles a little weird, though, especially since no other episode after this uses them again. Giving this episode another look really makes it clear to me that Ed just kinda didn't know what he was doing back then. He just sort of threw jokes together to see what worked and what didn't, like the joke about the Ku Klux Klan. If Ed made that same joke in a newer episode, it would be way too dark and just downright out of place. It's only on screen for a few seconds, but still. Now, on the whole, is the 2004 Christmas special still worth watching after all these years? Well, that depends on how you feel. If you want to see how Ed's World got its start, watch it. If you don't like the old style, then don't watch it. From my perspective, notwithstanding a few oddities here and there, I think this episode is just fine. But this would only set the stage for many more grander episodes to come.
After the surprising success of the 2004 Christmas special, here we are at the second episode of Ed's World, The Dudette Next Door. This was definitely not what people would expect to follow after the Christmas episode, and it tries a few new things, but is still kind of messy in places. So what's the story? A girl named Kim moves in next door to Ed and Tord, and the whole episode is just them fighting over her. That's about it. It's a classic comedic setup, two guys fighting for a girl's heart and blowing it out of proportion. That's primarily where the humor comes from, and it works. Ed brings her chocolates, only to see Tord bring her an even bigger box of chocolates. Ed pushes Tord into the pool to screw up his chance at impressing her, but then it turns out to actually work. Somehow, she gives Tord a kiss and that causes Ed to start fighting him. And all this leads up to the kind of ending you'd expect from this story, but with a really unique twist. I won't ruin it for those who haven't seen it, but needless to say, it's actually very refreshing. But even though there are moments that tie in with the story and are also really funny, there are also moments that don't really add anything to the story, such as Ed and Tord's first fight. First off, Tord shows up dressed as Rambo. If he's trying to impress Kim with that, it would probably scare her more than impress her. Second, from a storytelling perspective, it's better to save the fight for the end and use the humor that comes from their rivalry to build up to it. And they do have one at the end, but it just makes this first fight seem kind of unnecessary. Though to be fair, it does give us this. Honestly, I think the appeal of this episode really does come from how much Ed and Tord are willing to kill each other just to get Kim to like them. If you like those kind of setups, you'll enjoy it. If not, then it's probably only worth watching for the animation. It's not that much better from the last one, but it's plain to see that Ed put just a little more effort into it. Kim's design, however, is kind of jarring. Not because she's attractive, but she looks too well-drawn. You have Ed and Tord in that same sloppy Ed's World style, and then you have this other character drawn in more of an anime-ish look. Then again, she doesn't appear in the episode that much, so it's not too distracting. The sound mixing, on the other hand, is very distracting. There are times when one piece of music plays over another piece of music, times when music cuts out later than it should, times when music plays for less than two seconds, and sometimes the music and sound effects are just a little too loud. I know this episode was made when Ed was very young, and I know that he improves, but somehow the audio mixing is worse than the last episode. Not terrible, but I can't help but let it bother me a little. Still, it doesn't turn me off from this episode completely. Ed certainly stepped his game up a bit from the last video, and it seems to me like this is the episode that changed things up for him. It got just a little more attention than the Christmas video, and for the most part, it's very enjoyable. If anything, my issues with it are more nuances than legitimate problems. Dude at Next Door is a fun little romp with a great setup and some very funny moments. If you don't mind a little mindless violence for the most needless of reasons, check it out and enjoy the ride. If you've seen any of Ed's oldest projects, you'll know how much of a fascination he had for zombies. It seemed like he used them in his cartoons all the time, and nowhere is this more noticeable than with the Zombie Attack trilogy. These episodes were pretty special for their time. They were the first to follow a continuing story, and they're the only classic Ed's World episodes I know of that actually maintain some sort of continuity. But are the Zombie Attack episodes any good? Well, that's what you're here to find out, isn't it? The first episode starts with the guy's car breaking down, and so they need to find a repair kit. Wait, couldn't they just call a tow truck? Maybe it's a British thing. Anyway, they go into town and discover that the whole place is infested with zombies, one of which bites Matt's arm off. Ed, Tom, and Tord go away to gather weapons to take out the rest of the zombies, only for Tord to be bitten in the process. After his funeral at the start of the second episode, Tord emerges from his grave and recruits Ed to help him find the Necronomicon in order to properly put his soul to rest. 
Obviously, this is a nod to Evil Dead. In fact, Ash even makes a cameo. It <gasps> doesn't end well. Matt comes back as well and has Tom help him find the book too. But it turns out there are three books and Matt chooses the one that sucks him into a void. Tord finds the right one and departs into the afterlife. Matt manages to escape, however, and this leads into the third and final episode where he leads a new zombie uprising. With Tord out of the picture, it's up to Ed and Tom to stop it. Huh. You'd think for the finale to a trilogy, there'd be a lot more stuff going on, but it's actually the least eventful of the three. The only big thing I can recall happening is Ed and Tom killing a bunch of zombies. The ending's kind of fitting, and I won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it, but with the first two episodes building up so much, the third one just kind of slows down and doesn't close out the story on a particularly high note. It's sort of like the Amazing Spider-Man trilogy, only the third one actually happened. That's not to say I didn't enjoy Zombie Attack 3, because I did. I enjoyed all of them. Like with a lot of classic Ed's World episodes, the humor comes from interactions between the characters, jokes subtly hidden in the background, and the crudeness of the animation, particularly in Zombie Attack 1. The style continues to evolve over the course of the trilogy up to the final part, where it's definitely the most defined. If I'll be really honest though, there was always one thing about the Zombie Attack episodes that really bothered me. In Zombie Attack 1, Tord starts out with the voice of Alex Lab, but then suddenly near the end it's the real Tord's voice. What, did he just get zapped with a voice changer from Space Face at some point off screen? I know Alex was voicing Tord because the real Tord didn't have a microphone to record with, but couldn't Ed just have him redub Alex's lines after getting the new mic? Or was he just that determined to get it out he didn't want to bother redoing the lip sync? Another thing that kind of bothers me is how Zombie Attack 2 uses Matt and Tord's real last names on their tombstones, but only because I try to separate the characters from their real-life counterparts as much as possible. Fortunately, those two minor gripes aren't enough to ruin these episodes entirely for me. They're still a ton of fun to watch, and for the time, it must have been really exciting to see Ed pull off a standalone trilogy like this. The story's very dark, silly, and quite enjoyable, even if it doesn't have a big, epic conclusion. There are lots of spot-on Ed's World jokes, like the fact that there's just a boiling fondue pot lying around for Matt to fall in, and that his severed arm is labeled Property of Matt. It's just so ridiculous, but you can't help but love it. It's impressive how Ed manages to retain the continuity within all three episodes during a time where he wasn't taking his work that seriously. There's a lot to appreciate about the Zombie Attack trilogy, and what it so humbly accomplished should not go unnoticed. It's the holiday season in Ed's World once again, as it's time to take a look at the 2005 Ed's World Christmas Special. With the first Christmas special, Santa broke his leg and tasked Ed and the guys with delivering the remainder of his presents. That's quite a big undertaking. So what kind of crazy shenanigans are they going to get up to this time? Honestly, not a whole lot. In fact, the story as a whole feels kind of thrown together at the last minute. Ed's guardian angel comes to him one night to show him what the world would be like if he'd never existed, hoping he'll change his ways after seeing it. Despite not previously displaying any Ebenezer Scrooge-like characteristics to warrant a visit from a guardian angel, Ed agrees to go with him. Okay, I'm bored anyway. In this alternate universe, Tord is a successful comic strip artist and full-on communist, Tom is a big filmmaker who works with Tord on making... adult films, and Matt is a tramp on the streets. Oh, and apparently the Coca-Cola company shut down all their factories because sales plummeted without Ed being around to excessively buy their products. There's a lot of things to process with this story, and I know it's just a harmless web cartoon, but it really doesn't make any sense. The Guardian Angel says that Ed needed to change his ways, but does he? The opening doesn't establish how he mistreats his friends or his co-workers. Is it trying to imply that he's not running his studio in a way that he could be? Well, it's Christmas, so nobody's really expected to be working hard around this time. 
Maybe if Ed was pushing everyone to keep working despite it being Christmas, then the line about him needing to change his ways would make sense. But then again, Ed would never do that, so it would be really out of character. And you know what's depressing? When he sees what his friends would be like if he didn't exist, his best friend is homeless, his favorite soft drink is discontinued, and Tom and Tord seem to be better off without him. And he's essentially being forced to witness this. Ed did nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve to be put through all this. Nobody does. Frankly, it's a horrible thing to even think about. But how does Ed process all this? I don't know. He doesn't seem to be affected at all, except for Coca-Cola going out of business. And even then, he seems to get over it pretty quickly. You see what I mean when I said this story felt thrown together at the last minute? There didn't seem to be a whole lot of thought put into it, and there's just a ton of elements that don't make any sense whatsoever, more than previous episodes. I'm guessing Ed was behind schedule, so he came up with this in about a few minutes, and quickly put it into production as soon as possible. As a result, nothing about this episode really leaves an impact on me. There's something interesting here, like maybe switching Ed out with Tom would save it a little bit? It'd make more sense because Tom doesn't celebrate Christmas, as he states at the end of the episode. And I'll admit, I'm probably taking this a little too seriously. But if I notice a few very big things wrong with something, they're gonna make a difference when I look at the whole picture. I think the 2005 Christmas special might be the only classic Ed's World episode I've seen where the story actually gets in the way of everything. Not even the animation adds a lot of charm or humor, which is really surprising because usually the crudeness of it makes any old Ed's World episode more enjoyable. All in all, this episode's pretty much a dud. I don't hate it per se, but it's just not well put together. If Ed had more time to develop the story, we could have had something kinda cool like a Christmas Carol parody with that Ed's World Edge. As it is, however, I don't really see anything in the 2005 Christmas special that makes it worth coming back to. Not one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life, but I'd say you can go ahead and give it a pass. The zombies are back as we get a kinda sorta spin-off to the Zombie Attack trilogy in the form of Zombie Nation, which is actually the first episode to portray Tom with black eyes instead of the unibrow. Yeah, there's a random fun fact to start the video with. Now here's another one. This is such a fun episode. If the Zombie Attack trilogy felt like Dawn of the Dead, then Zombie Nation is very much Shaun of the Dead. Matt's on a train going through the station, but as it makes it stop, he's greeted by a horde of, what else? Zombies. He calls up his friends who are just sitting at home playing Maniac Mansion. So how do they react when they hear that their friend is trapped in a zombie infested train station? Meh. But he has the emergency cola. Oh, so I guess that means we have to save him now. I just love how apathetic they are about the fact that their friend could possibly get killed and eaten by zombies. Zombie Nation is one of those classic Ed's World cases where the story kinda takes a backseat to make way for a series of jokes, but this one is much more character focused. Compared to previous episodes, the humor in this one comes less from the crude animation, which is especially crude in this one, I mean just look at Matt's arms here, and instead comes from the characters just doing funny things. It's funny to see them riding around in a bathtub on wheels. It's funny to see Ed and Tord throw Tom at a gate to open it. It's funny to see Matt pick up a symbol playing monkey while trying to find a weapon, but then saying it's too predictable. Oh my square chinned friend, if only you knew what was to come. And it's funny to see Tord have no problem using a baseball bat to fight off zombies, even though he was bummed about not being allowed to use guns in Zombie Attack 1. Some future episodes will get away with having a lot of jokes to make up for not telling much of a story, and if I'll be real for a second, the jokes in Zombie Nation aren't very coherent. They're just funny character moments, and to be honest, I think it actually makes the episode more enjoyable. It's not like the 2005 Christmas special where the story is so lacking that it distracts from everything else. Zombie Nation works a lot better in terms of writing. It's certainly much more focused. It knows what direction it wants to go in, it doesn't try to add anything else, and it's perfectly serviceable. 
Now, I'd just like to point out that the reason why I didn't make this part of the zombie attack video is because I personally find Zombie Nation to be too different in tone to those episodes when it comes to making comparisons. The Zombie Attack trilogy had a consistently dark tone throughout all three episodes involving characters dying, becoming zombies, and turning against each other. Zombie Nation plays up the comedy a lot more and doesn't take itself too seriously, but if you ask me, I find it more enjoyable because of that. I still have a big appreciation for the Zombie Attack episodes, but I would definitely see myself going back to Zombie Nation more. The larger focus on comedy makes it more fun to watch, the jokes and character moments are still making me chuckle after all these years, and even if the story doesn't seem as big or grand as the Zombie Attack trilogy, as a standalone episode, it still really works. If you have the time, I'd say go back and watch it. You won't believe how much it makes being trapped in a closed space with vicious, bloodthirsty zombies so frickin' fun. This is going to be a very special recap because I'm going to be talking about Hello Hellhole, the very first Edsworld episode I ever saw. It was the year 2008 when a friend of mine showed it to me for the first time, and it was Hello Hellhole that made me an Edsworld fan. It was the strangest, silliest, most out there piece of animation I'd ever seen on the internet, and I loved it. But with a name like Hello Hellhole, what exactly can you expect from something like this? Well, there's no better way to sum it up than by playing this clip from the interview I did with Tom. They try to watch the DVD, but the TV explodes, so <laughs> then they just decide to Google how to go to hell, and then they go to hell, and then they do some things in hell, and then they leave. Yeah, it's really basic. In fact, compared to earlier episodes, this is probably the simplest one so far. Episodes like Dudette Next Door and the Zombie Attack trilogy had some sort of conflict and overarching story. Hello Hellhole doesn't have either of those, but you know what? I don't think it really needs them, because the big thing that makes Hello Hellhole so enjoyable is its humor. The lack of any reason behind their decision to literally go to hell is hilarious. The idea of hell itself being both a place of eternal damnation and a pleasant tourist attraction is hilarious. The fact that the only real pain the guys go through comes from getting glimpses of some utterly ridiculous personal hells is hilarious. It's almost like watching an episode of The Simpsons or Futurama, both of which Ed was a fan of. It's just an onslaught of joke after joke, and all of them are great. Even some gags like the line rider bit, which might come off as a bit out of place. If there was anything I had to say I think it missed, well, I would have liked to see more character-based jokes. With a show like Ed's World, most of the time when you're just putting the characters in an interesting scenario, the episode writes itself. But the only ones we get are in the personal hell sequence. Some of them work, but the other two don't really make that much sense. When has Matt ever expressed that much hatred towards Ed? And Tom's bit with the black man from outer space, despite how much it made me laugh, just seems random for the sake of being random. If there's any place where the humor works completely, it's the animation. It has that classic Ed's World crudity, but what I love most about it are the expressions. Ed was always so good at giving his characters the best possible physical and facial expressions, and it definitely shows here. Just look at Tom's face when he falls from the ceiling in this restaurant. You just see his eyes open really wide, no mouth, no real pain or suffering, it's just great. The whole episode is great too. Hello Hellhole will always have a special place in my heart. As an introduction to Ed's world, it pretty much sums up everything that makes the show so great. It absorbs itself into the silliness of its setup, it never goes too far, even if it sometimes doesn't go far enough, and it's just an all-around good time. Watch it again if you're in the mood for something wonderfully absurd, or when your TV explodes and you don't have anything better to do. Either way, give it a look.
What happens when you take the characters from Ed's World, the goofiness of the Mummy movies, and make it intentionally funny? You get ruined. For years, I always thought this was an extremely underrated episode, but I had no idea why. So this video is mostly going to be about me re-watching this episode and giving you my new and current thoughts and opinions on it, which is pretty much the point of this entire series, but let's go ahead and take a look. Ed breaks Tom's bass guitar after using it to kill a spider and decides to bury it in the backyard. But as he digs through the ground, he finds an old Egyptian door that could possibly have treasure underneath. Matt and Tor decide to go down with Ed because they want the treasure, and Tom goes with them because... I don't know, honestly. We see him freak out over his bass getting messed up, but he seems to get over that pretty quickly. Then again, maybe he's just used to having it get wrecked all the time. So on their way down, the rope breaks and traps them in the ancient ruins. And not only that, but there's also a mummy on the loose. So now they have to find their way out while avoiding whatever dangers come their way. And need I bring up the mummy again? It sounds like a pretty simple setup, and in many respects, it is. And there's nothing really even very epic about it. There are no explosions, no zombie hordes, so what exactly makes Ruin such a great episode? Well, that's the thing. It doesn't need any of that. Here's what happens. You've got Ed and the guys, they go on an adventure, and there's a bunch of jokes. It follows the basic structure that any classic Ed's World episode follows, and it does it well. It's wholesome, it's charming, and most importantly, it's funny. And it doesn't just work as a regular episode, it's also the perfect anything that can go wrong, does go wrong kind of episode. I just love all the situations they get involved in. Matt and Tord are trapped in a room with spike walls closing in on them, sand pouring down from the ceiling, and the only thing that can make it worse is to have a giant speaker play sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. Ed pushes Tom into a corridor filled with booby traps and just plays with his yo-yo as Tom gets shot, cut, bruised, and god knows what else. The comedy in this episode ranges from character-based to visual-based to just plain silly. It does whatever it wants to get a laugh out of people, and it works. It has that classic gag where characters are depicted in the dark by just their eyeballs, but it's made even funnier with the inclusion of a character that doesn't have eyeballs. It's such an obvious joke to make with Tom, but it still gets me every single time. I know I'm focusing a lot on the comedy and not so much on the actual story, or anything else for that matter, but Ruined really is a funny episode. It never gets old to me, no matter how many times I watch it. This could have easily just been a throwaway episode with not that much time and effort put into it, but Ed just made it so entertaining. I think he really cared about giving people a good laugh, and even if the jokes don't always make you bust a gut, you'd have to be as solid as a rock to not chuckle at least once or twice. I'm not gonna act like Ruin is the best episode, because it's not. I've praised it for being so funny, but there are a lot more episodes to come that are way funnier. Even so, Ruined is still in my top 5 favorites. It does more with the idea than what could be possible for the time, it doesn't overstay its welcome or understay its welcome, the jokes are still so funny after all these years, and it's a textbook example of what makes a good Ed's World episode. Ruined is a hidden treasure that more than deserves to be uncovered. Wow, Tom, I knew you liked my music, but you didn't have to list my name five times in the end credits. Ah well, let's talk about the 2007 Ed's World Halloween special. There have been some episodes of Ed's World that weren't afraid to tackle Halloween-related topics such as zombies, mummies, or even hell itself. But the show never usually did full-out Halloween specials. There might have been a few in the past, but this is certainly the first one that people think of. In this episode, the guys are harassed by an axe-wielding maniac in a hockey mask. We don't know who he is, where he came from, or what his beef with the four of them is, but that doesn't matter. He's eager to chop some heads, and he's not gonna stop until he does it. Spoiler warning, he does. He kills Ed, Tom, and Tord, but Matt does himself in by falling down the stairs. Then he comes back up, sees them as ghosts, and dies of a heart attack. 
He nearly escapes the grip of a serial killer, but his clumsiness and timidness are what get him in the end. That is hilariously tragic. But just because they're ghosts doesn't mean they can't get a little revenge. They knock the perp unconscious and throw him off a cliff, where he lands on a bunch of spikes. Then he returns as a ghost, doing his best impression of Chernabog from Fantasia. But before he can finish what he started, all of them are captured by, who else? The Ghostbusters, including Luigi. And that's the entire episode. Short, sweet, and to the point. I like it. This episode does so much in so little time. It kills off each of the main characters one by one, but don't worry, there's no real continuity to the show, so they'll be back in the next one. It delivers on some really funny jokes with a nice, great nut shot for good measure. And it surprisingly packs a lot of atmosphere. When the maniac comes bursting through the door, the seriousness of the issue just punches you in the face. Almost as hard as that nut shot. But it's not the gruesome kind of scary, it's the fun Halloween-y kind of scary. That's established right away with the opening, with a jack-o'-lantern falling on Ed's head and Matt busting his skull with a mallet. Even the look on this pumpkin's face just says, Ooh, I'm supposed to be a spoopy punk pin, but I know I'm really not. And look at this guy casually cleaning his axe after killing a whole bunch of people. It's like being a serial killer is a regular job to him. Now let's talk about the animation for a second. It's not the greatest I've seen, but I'm genuinely impressed with Ed's work here. Compared to previous episodes, the characters seem to be much more expressive. I don't know what it is, maybe it's just the way that Ed drew them for this particular episode, but that's just what I see. And the killer presents a wide range of emotions despite wearing a hockey mask. It's the way his eyes are animated, like Deadpool or Spider-Man in the MCU. I even like some of the smaller things, like how Ed animated the ghost trap. Yeah, I'm like that guy on Miiverse who talks about how good the water looks in different video games. And before anyone asks me in the comment section, yes, I actually composed the music for the Legacy re-upload. I wasn't approached to do it, I just took the original video, put my own music to it, sent it over, and then they did the rest. I'm still surprised that Tom liked it so much, but I'm glad that he did. And if I had to do the music for any episode, it had to be this one. The 2007 Ed's World Halloween special is a fun ride from start to finish. It's funny, it's scary, it's campy, it's dark. It's everything that makes Halloween so enjoyable. Grab your axe and your... sword, and don't be afraid to give this one a swing. One of the most memorable characters in the Ed's World universe is probably Santa Claus. He's like if Aku from Samurai Jack pretended to be Santa Claus, he's both scary and hilarious. He also does his job like Jack Skellington tried to do it in The Nightmare Before Christmas, making every kid's Christmas not quite so merry. There were three episodes of the show that prominently featured him, this one doesn't count. Starting with the 2007 Ed's World Christmas special simply called Santa Claus. Now, why am I covering the Santa Claus episodes in their own separate videos when I talked about all three Zombie Attack episodes in just one video? Well, Zombie Attack 1 to 3 weren't quite big enough to warrant individual reviews, but the Santa Claus episodes? I think they are. You'll see why when I give you the plot summary. An evil, undead version of Santa Claus is going into houses on the street, finding all the bad children, and... ...doing that. And it turns out that Ed and the guys are on his naughty list, so basically their goal is to not get eaten by a horrific-looking zombie in a Santa Claus costume. A typical Christmas conundrum. For the first Santa Claus episode, you might be shocked to see how simple the story is. But from my perspective, it's kind of like going back to the first Crash Bandicoot game. You see the groundwork be laid out for its successors, and going back to it is a neat experience, but while the first Crash game got increasingly difficult to sit through, Santa Claus 1 is nowhere near as frustrating. It also doesn't feel as thrown together at the last minute as the 2005 Christmas special. The story might be basic, but at least you can tell that SOME thought and care went into it. And that's made clear with the humor as well. 
This episode has some of the funniest jokes and visual gags I've ever seen in anything Ed's World related. I'm serious. What's not to love about Xanta accusing Tom of eating a pie that we see him holding, only to cut to the next shot of Tom having just eaten the pie? Or when the guys get away from Xanta on a bunch of Coca-Cola trucks, only for Matt to be left behind and stow away on another Coke truck that just happens to be driving by? Or when Xanta's standing on the truck with them and making a threatening <laughs> statement, but keeps getting whacked in the face by some tree branches, and then the joke is repeated with Tom in the best possible way. Holy happy holidays in the hat. Holy happy holidays. Holy ha. Yeah, a lot of these gags could be seen as a bit dumb to most people, but I don't care. No matter how many times I watch this episode, the jokes still make me laugh, and I can't get enough of them. And really, it all just comes down to Xanta himself. Here, he's not as much of a funny villain as he is in future episodes, but the bits with him aren't any less enjoyable. Need I bring up? <laughs> One of the greatest aspects of his character is undoubtedly his voice. Josh Tomar is the man behind those gravelly pipes, and he brings so much to a character that's, on paper, written kind of flat. But the way he delivers his lines and the qualities he brings to the character, he just gets lost in the role and helps make Santa Claus something really special. Xanta is one of my favorite characters in the entire series, almost entirely because of Josh's voice. He also voices the real Santa, and he's great in that part too, but Xanta just wouldn't be Xanta without him. Getting back on topic, the first Santa Claus episode is classic. If I'd been an Ed's World fan in 2007 and saw this episode for the first time, this is just the kind of Christmas special I would have wanted Ed's World to do. Something funny, something twisted, something eccentric, something bizarre, something that no other animated series, whether on TV or on the internet, would ever do. Out of the Santa Claus trilogy, this one isn't my personal favorite, but when it comes to Ed's World episodes in general, Santa Claus 1 is surely near the top on my nice list. Ever since I first saw it, Spares has been one of my all-time favorite Ed's World episodes. I will never understand how this freakish clone hybrid that only appears on screen for a few seconds became so popular, and these Google search results have me raising several questions. Seriously, this is a thing? But what I fell in love with was how off-the-wall and bizarre this episode was. I'd already seen a couple of episodes before I got to Spares, so I was not prepared for what I was about to watch. An evil director is upset with his movie about a super powerful demon mutant zombie pirate magic ninja evil overlord from hell and outer space, only bringing in four viewers, them being Ed, Matt, Tom, and Tord. So with the help of a cloning machine made of monkeys, and absolutely no assistance from his business partner Larry, the evil director makes four million clones of them to get more people to see his film. But the clones run off and cause trouble, and the guys don't seem to have a problem with it. That is, until one of them takes Ed's last can of cola out of the fridge, suddenly it's war. There's guns, explosions, bloodshed, all kinds of violence. Basically, a bunch of clones of the guys are made, and they do a lot of funny stuff. There's a trend in Ed's world where the plot of each episode kinda takes a backseat for a slew of jokes and visual gags, but I think Spares was the first big episode to completely embrace that. The story itself isn't even that coherent. The clones are made, they see the movie, they leave, they go to the arcade, they burn it down, they go to the house, some action happens, and that's it. But that doesn't bother me in the slightest. Spares works remarkably well for what it is. It's certainly one of the strangest episodes of Ed's World, but it's aware of that. It knows that this is a weird idea, but it doesn't care. This episode really has fun with its setup. There's a great recurring joke of Tom getting shoved into a dumpster. For the first two times, it's done to a Tom clone because he's too girly. And for the last one, it's done with the real Tom by his own friends. And they replace him with a Matt clone. Why? I don't know and I don't care because it's funny. 
That's another thing I like about the humor. Not only does it come from how odd the setup is and how aware the episode is of it, but it also comes from, again, how much it doesn't care. How does the evil director make a cloning machine out of monkeys? I don't care, but it's funny. How does a truck come bursting through the wall when one of the clones is playing an arcade game? I don't care, but it's funny. Why is one of the Ed clones naked when they walk past Helicard? I don't... well, you get the idea. I wasn't sure how much Ed could do with the idea of there being clones of him and the others, but just like Ruined, he did whatever he thought could make people laugh. And in Spares, it really works. But what is it about its absurdity and weirdness that makes it so wonderful? Is it how it's used? Is it how it plays with your expectations? Is it how it's not overblown or too over the top? Well, to me, this is one of those cases where you just kind of have to watch and decide for yourself. Spares is an experience that no other Ed's World episode can give. The show has a lot of silly and weird moments, but those are what Spares is entirely based upon. I mean, it's not like being on a drug high or anything, it just takes this idea of the guys being cloned and goes with it. It's really something you have to see to believe. And I think that's why it's one of my favorite episodes. It's the feeling you get from watching it that makes it so unique. There's really no other episode like Spares, and I love it for that. If I had a clone, we would give it four thumbs way up. In the first Ed's World recap, I said I was introduced to Ed's World when one of my friends showed me a couple episodes in 6th grade during woodshop class. First he showed me Hello Hellhole, and then he showed me Moving Targets. After Hello Hellhole, I wasn't sure what I was going to get with this episode, but what I got was something much funnier and more unexpected than I thought. Hello Hellhole was the one that made me a fan, but I have to admit, I enjoyed Moving Targets a lot more. The plot revolves around Ed and the guys trying to plan a vacation, but they can't afford it. Then, after seeing a commercial for the military on TV, they say to themselves, you know what, screw it, let's join the army. Because apparently enlisting for the British military is less expensive than planning a vacation. I don't know, I've never enlisted for the army and I don't really plan to. And of course, once they get there, they realize that the military isn't all it's cracked up to be. That and they're just really bad at everything. If you know how Ed's world works at this point, moving targets is going to be exactly what you think. Ed, Matt, Tom, and Tord in the army. Oh boy, this is going to be a riot. And yeah, it is. Still to this day, it's one of the funniest Ed's world episodes I've ever seen. The setup is funny, the characters are funny, the hijinks that ensue are some of the best in the whole series. From something small like Ed singing Flight of the Valkyries while flying a helicopter, to something extreme like the guys driving a tank through an enemy base. I love how it just stays on this one shot, how it focuses on the tank as it's driving through the walls and blasting everything in sight. And the guys don't even realize this while they're inside the tank. And I wouldn't dare keep talking about the jokes without bringing up this one. So the guys fall into the enemy base, and there's this wood plank stationed on a barrel. Tord falls on one side of the plank, and Ed, Matt, and Tom fall onto the other side. You think this is gonna fling Tord through the air, but it doesn't. The plank breaks in the middle. Everything's all good then, right? Nope, there's a hippo. This scene killed me when I was younger. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. Maybe I was just easy to impress back then, but even now, I still love this bit. It toys with your expectations in the only way Ed's World can do it. Oh, and remember in my Santa Claus review when I said Josh Tomar helped make Xanta one of my favorite Ed's World characters? Well, here he is again providing the voice of Sergeant Hillerson. But don't call him Hillary, because then... That happens. And Josh, God bless you, man. You've completely managed to become a totally separate character, and you make Hillerson so funny and so unforgettable. The more I listen to your voice here, the more I forget that it's you behind the mic. I don't know how you're able to voice two unique and iconic Ed's World characters, but you're just so remarkable. 
It's elements like Josh's performance as Hillary, I mean, Sergeant Hillerson, that help make moving targets such a great time. I laughed when I first saw it, and I'm still laughing now. It's easily one of my top five favorite Ed's World episodes of all time, right up there with Ruined and Hello Hellhole. What else can I say about it that I haven't already said about other episodes I liked? I love the setup, I love the jokes, the characters are great, it's unpredictable, it's eccentric. I've said these things about other episodes in the past, so I won't repeat myself too much. When it comes to moving targets, this episode is genuinely worth a shot. After the release of Moving Targets, Tord Larson left Ed's World for various reasons. Either he left to pursue a solo career as a comic artist, or he didn't like the attention that fans were giving him. Which sadly has caused him to literally live in hiding all these years later, seriously people leave him alone. Because of this, Ed never got the chance to make a full episode dedicated to the departure of his character, so he shoehorned it into the opening of 25 Feet Under the Seat. I don't think it was really a huge loss, since I personally never found his character to be that interesting. He really just felt like the fourth one to me. In the last episode he was in, he only got one line, and it was this. Phew. What I did find interesting was the mystery that his exit created within the show's world. A mystery that wouldn't be solved until many years later. In an admittedly kind of disrespectful way, but we'll get to that when we get to that. The episode begins with Matt accidentally flushing his keys down the toilet. Now you're probably asking yourself why he brought his keys with him into the bathroom in the first place, but of course the answer is, why wouldn't you? So logically, the guys flush themselves down the drain to try and get the keys back, but as a result, they end up in the Kingdom of Atlantis. So Atlantis existed beneath England's sewage system this whole time? That explains so much, and yet so little. As they continue on their undersea travels, they find that Matt's keys are now being displayed in a museum dedicated to human paraphernalia. I think it's called the Little Mermaid Exhibition. But when Matt tries to take them, they get in trouble with the local authorities. Then while trying to get away, they accidentally release a dangerous sea creature. Then they get caught, they're sent up back to the surface, and that's it. Yeah, nothing too eventful really happens in this episode. It's more of a this happens than this happens kind of thing. This structure's worked for Ed's World before, like with Hello Hellhole. Unlike that episode, however, 25 Feet Under the Seat doesn't deliver on that many jokes. There's the bit with the plumber stuck in the sink. Some of the stuff in the museum made me chuckle. The flashback sequence showing Tom's life story is pretty funny. And their punishment at the end is funny too. They're sentenced to death by oxygen, which is the most deadly form of execution in Atlantis, since, you know, they can't breathe it. And the guys aren't even affected by it. Plus, Tom's little quip at the end about him breaking Ed's cat and not being sorry for it ties things up pretty nicely. But for a majority of the episode, it's usually just them walking around, looking at stuff, maybe some Simpsons-style background jokes here and there, and a couple of moments with the Atlanteans. A particular highlight for me is the king. This is the funniest character in the whole episode. His way of speaking is comedically exaggerated, and the animation on him is great. But he's only the funniest character in the episode because the comedy is surprisingly subdued compared to previous episodes like Moving Targets. I wouldn't say putting less emphasis on the humor makes 25 Feet Under the Seat boring, though. If anything, it's kind of like Wallace and Gromit, where the comedy is very subtle and underplayed. The whole episode feels a lot like Wallace and Gromit come to think of it, particularly A Grand Day Out. The characters want something, they take extreme measures to get it, they end up in a vastly different place, and there are other characters trying to stop them. I'm not sure how much of an influence Wallace and Gromit had on Ed, but that's just what I've come to notice. And while I've praised episodes like Spares and Moving Targets for moments like the truck bursting through the arcade or Tord being crushed by a Hippo for absolutely no reason, it's actually kind of refreshing to see Ed's world pull back on its more outlandish humor. 25 Feet Under the Seat has a very relaxed and laid-back tone, and it remains consistent throughout the whole episode. 
Although I personally think it would have benefited from just a couple more jokes, I find myself appreciating this episode a lot more. If you don't know what to make of 25 Feet Under the Sea, I suggest you dive back into those waters and give it another look. You want to know why I'm doing this Ed's World retrospective in October? Well, October is the month of Halloween, today's episode is Halloween related, it's Friday the 13th, and this is the 13th video in my series. Everything just falls into place. Speaking of today's episode, we're talking about Matt Sucks. This one might be pretty short, and in hindsight, I probably could have done this and the 2007 Halloween special in the same video, but who cares? We're doing it now, so let's go. It starts with Matt going trick-or-treating wearing the pink bunny costume from A Christmas Story, and then he gets bitten by a vampire. Don't you just hate when that happens? I can hardly ever go trick-or-treating and walk even half a step without some bloodthirsty creature of the night trying to kill me. I'm getting off topic, aren't I? Anyway, once those sharp pointed teeth dig into his neck, Matt is turned into a vampire. Compelled by his newfound thirst, Matt goes back to the house to try and suck Ed and Tom's blood, both times failing spectacularly in his face. He goes for Ed first, but is forced into taking him to dinner and a movie. Must be a dine-in theater. And when he gets home, he mistakes Tom for a pile of garlic and bites into it. Which raises the question of why Tom would have a pile of garlic in his room to begin with. Then before he can make a second attempt, Ed and Tom end up accidentally killing themselves after playing with a MEGA STEAK MACHINE GUN. Hold up. Tom has two of the things that vampires are weak to, the garlic in his room and now this. So, did he know that vampires were roaming around and buy all this stuff to protect himself? Well, obviously that didn't work out so well for him, but what about Matt? Well, without any blood to suck, the sun comes up and he decides to go for a walk, only to spontaneously combust until only his eyeballs are left. Oh well, at least Ed's dead. Hmm, for some reason that closing line makes me a little uncomfortable now. So, there we go, that's the entire episode, and what an event. I'm pretty much used to Ed's World episodes having weird scenarios at this point, and Matt Sucks is no exception. Here's what I find interesting, though. Like in 25 Feet Under the Sea, the humor in this episode is surprisingly toned down, aside from the stake gun and maybe the ending. And again, like with 25 Feet Under the Sea, it's kind of refreshing to see an Ed's World episode do this. But one thing that Matt Sucks has over 25 Feet is that the jokes are just a little bit funnier. A bat flies up in front of Ed's house making you think it's Matt, but then Matt just falls from the sky right on top of the bat. Although I like 25 Feet Under the Seat for its more laid-back tone, I still think a few weirder moments would have made it funnier. Matt Sucks doesn't have this setback. It's still a bit more relaxed, which is odd considering Matt's an actual vampire throughout a majority of the episode, but it knows when to have eccentric bits of comedy and when to just have the characters be themselves. When it comes to its humor, it seems to work a little better. Matt Sucks isn't the biggest and grandest Halloween special that the show has done, but I can proudly say that I enjoy watching it a lot more now than I used to back then. It maybe could have done a little more with the idea of Matt being a vampire, and perhaps it could be a bit funnier if Ed and Tom try to kill him not knowing that it was Matt. But it's clearly just supposed to be a simple little Halloween cartoon, and as simple little Halloween cartoons go, it's still very enjoyable. And despite what the title might make you think, this episode really doesn't suck.
Just when you thought Santa Claus was done for in last year's Christmas episode, now he's back and there's gonna be trouble. Santa Claus 2 is, of course, the sequel to the first Santa Claus episode, and this is very exciting for me because I get to look at another episode with one of my favorite Ed's World characters of all time. And knowing how unpredictable Xanta himself can be, it should be hard for newcomers to go into this knowing what he's going to do next. After Santa Claus came and presumably punched Xanta into space at the end of Santa Claus 1, sometime off screen Xanta managed to kidnap him and now has him locked up in his fortress. Knowing that Ed and the guys will somehow find a way to stop him, even though it was clearly Santa who was the one that stopped him the first time, Xanta sends a group of explosive Christmas carolers to try and destroy them. It doesn't work, however, so they get into their car, with Z-Gear equipped, and make their way to the North Pole to try and rescue jolly old Saint Nick. It's never really made clear what exactly Xanta's plan is this time. In the first one, he was trying to take Santa's place and use it as an opportunity to... Okay, I think we're done with that joke. I'm guessing his plan for Santa Claus 2 is to try and take Santa's place again, since we're told that he kidnapped him and also stole his sleigh. But we never see him visit houses like we do in Santa Claus 1. He's pretty much cooped up in his fortress the whole time, and because of that, he doesn't really get to do a lot of funny stuff. His interaction with the guys is pretty funny, but he was definitely much more active in the first episode. Now, even though Xanta himself is a touch bit disappointing here, everything else is still a ton of fun to watch. Matt Sucks and 25 Feet Under the Seat both underplayed the humor a little bit, but Santa Claus 2 brings back the goofy moments and then some. It kind of mixed the relaxed tone of the previous two episodes with a level of silliness that rivals spares in moving targets. The guys get into their car, Ed uses the Z-Gear, or Z-Gear if you're European, the car floats up into the air and lands on top of an airplane, then the plane drops and lands on top of another airplane, and by the time they get to the North Pole, there's like five planes stacked on top of each other. Then when they get- <clears throat> Oh god. Then when they get to Xanta's fortress, they're given gifts containing just what their hearts desired. So Ed gets a swimming pool filled with cola, Matt gets a lot of money, and Tom gets- Ugh. Another freaky set of eyes. <clears throat> oh jeez, good lord. But when they realize their gifts aren't as great as they thought they were- Ah, it burns! Well, of course it burns, you're looking right into the sun! Yeah, I know it's stupid, but it's the good kind of stupid, you know? Parts of this episode are just so nonsensical and weird that you can't help but love them. That's pretty much how it works with every Ed's World episode, folks. I'm 14 episodes in, and it just occurred to me that I haven't really given the animation a lot of focus in these reviews. This was around the end of 2008, and at this point, the characters and the style have become much more defined. There's a consistency with how they move, and the designs, while drastically different from when the show started, have well been established, and the guys are much easier to point out. I've always liked this particular style, because it kind of feels like a transitional period from Ed's cruder work to his post-university work that I'll look into when the time comes. For now though, Santa Claus 2 is highly rewatchable and a step up from its predecessor. While Xanta himself isn't given much to do and is unfortunately the weakest aspect of the episode for me, I think its great mix of eccentric humor with a laid-back vibe makes it worth going back to again and again. When Christmas comes around, all I really want from Ed's World is something that can make me laugh and make for an entertaining but unconventional Christmas special. In the case of Santa Claus 2, this is an episode that more than delivers. For years, my favorite Ed's World episode was Hammer and Fail. Everything about that episode was just perfect. The setup, the execution, the writing, the animation, it was about as great as an Ed's World episode could possibly be. Then in 2013, I began working on the Ed's World fan movie, and in the time since I started, my new favorite episode became Movie Makers. 
I connected with this episode straight away. And here's the thing, I don't think it's the funniest or even the best written episode of Ed's World there is, but Movie Makers is a reminder of how Ed's World has influenced me so much. The plot involves Tom spending all of his, Ed's, and Matt's money on a video camera, hoping it'll make him famous from shooting viral videos. It doesn't work, however, mostly because the internet CEO broke the World Wide Web by literally pulling the plug. So they decide to go back to the drawing board and make a legit film. Tom writes the script, Ed gathers props, Matt is put in charge of special effects, and they cast a girl named Laurel to play the lead. Then the rest of the episode pretty much follows them on their journey to make what they think is going to be the best movie ever, despite all the... mishaps that occur. Movie Makers was the first episode to have the real Tom be directly involved with the writing. So while the story is still pretty basic, as is the case with several other episodes, it does follow a coherent structure. The situation is established in the beginning, we see them go through the planning stages in the middle, and by the end, they have a movie made. The episode still delivers on a bunch of great jokes, but it's not written in the same way episodes like Hello Hellhole or Moving Targets were written. The funny moments come in at just the right time, the characters have motivation and a reason for wanting to make a movie, there's conflict that needs to be resolved, and everything has a point. Of course, there are elements of the story that maybe could have been done a little better. For example, I would have liked a little more reason behind Tom wanting to make movies. All we see is him walking by a store and seeing the video camera for sale in the window, but we don't know why he was so interested in buying it. Maybe there could be a film festival in town, or an online video making contest with a grand prize for the best movie being $1,000 or something? That would probably motivate Tom a little more. I mean, we really don't need that much reasoning behind Tom's decision, but I think it would have added a little more to the story. Another thing, and I'm not sure this will be controversial or not, Laurel as a character is just a touch bit bland. The guys didn't have incredibly defined personalities at this point in the show's lifespan, but there were still aspects of their characters that helped make them memorable. Laurel doesn't really have much of these qualities. The only thing that really makes her stand out is the fact that she's a girl. Maybe her quirk is that she's up for anything no matter how strange it is, but that's about it. It would have been interesting to see Laurel become a main character so that she could have been developed more, but apparently, Tom didn't like Ed's ideas for her, so they killed her off before she even had a chance. Oh well, at least her shoes found somebody to love. Which begs the question, how was Shu able to get them off her feet? But anyway, I think now is the best time for me to explain why Movie Makers is my favorite Ed's World episode. Well, the jokes are pretty funny, I'm still laughing quite a bit at a chunk of these moments. And despite some minor issues with the story, the writing as a whole is really good. Neither that or the humor are the best the series has to offer, in my opinion, so what makes Movie Makers so special to me? Well, like I said, it's a reminder of how much Ed's world has influenced me, but it's also a reminder of how much I love the art of filmmaking. The guys don't have a big reason for wanting to make a movie aside from needing extra money, they just go ahead and do it. They don't have the budget of a Hollywood summer blockbuster, they just work with what they have. There's a lot of charm, innocence, and creativity with how they put their film together. It's not so much about making things look realistic, it's to do it in a way that accomplishes the effect that you're going for. James Rolfe once said that if the audience can tell how an effect was done, that invites them into the filmmaking process. And there's a lot of truth to that. Making movies isn't just about the money or the fame or the attention, it's about challenging yourself. It's about testing your skills as an artist. It's about seeing what you're able to create with a camcorder and some painted cardboard, or even a cell phone and some trees. Movie Makers, for me personally, represents the passion and the drive that it takes to be a filmmaker. And that's why it's my absolute favorite Ed's World episode. If it takes a village or some duct tape and markers, you can do just about anything.
In 2009, the guys were asked to contribute a piece of animation to a conference where some of the biggest world leaders from around the globe would discuss the importance of protecting the environment and conserving energy and all that Captain Planet kind of stuff. But it's great that Ed was able to make something for a good cause, and I'm sure being seen by some of the most powerful people in the world was a big thing for him. This brings me to the environment-friendly Ed's World episode known as Climate Change. In it, Tom worries that Ed is using too much electricity and warns him of the dangers that could come from it. Ed pretty much says, id gaff, and later comes something for him to actually gaff about. A giant tidal wave caused by smoke clouds melting off a chunk of an iceberg in the middle of the Arctic. Before the wave can hit the house, Ed turns off all the electrical appliances he can find, and somehow this causes the tidal wave to turn around and just leave. Yeah, it's pretty silly, and even Ed realizes this. Well, that's just silly. This episode was clearly just made to be a save the environment kind of fair, but unlike the 2005 Christmas special, it doesn't feel like it was sloppily thrown together at the last minute. There was a good deal of thought and care that went into it. The story doesn't have a structure like movie makers, but climate change really isn't meant to be a big story-driven episode. Its purpose is to spread environment safety awareness across the world, and to warn people not to be careless with the electricity in their homes. It's a good message, and it could have easily been hammered into the point where it just seems laughable, like with Fern Gully and Once Upon a Forest. Thankfully, this episode keeps to the spirit of Ed's world. Climate change addresses the importance of preserving power without constantly reminding people to protect the environment for every second of its runtime. It delivers information when it needs to, it doesn't shove the moral into your face, and it depicts the dangers of using too much electricity in a way that's funny, understandable, and most importantly, subtle. And it still has those other funny moments we expect an Ed's World episode to have. Matt reads an electric-powered newspaper for crying out loud, how could you not find that funny? So, yeah, climate change is a pretty standard episode when you compare it to other Ed's World episodes, but when you judge it based on what it was made to do, I think it does its job really well. Nothing about it feels forced or contrived, it's just as funny as you would want it to be, and it's all for a good cause. I'm sorry if this video was too short for some of you, but if you want to take anything away from this, let it be this. Please be kind to the Earth, because if you don't, then a tidal wave is going to come destroy your house. And now we get to the big one, What the Future, the single most popular episode in the entire series. The one that almost everyone, including Ed himself, considers to be the absolute best one ever. And honestly, I think it's kind of overrated. But that doesn't mean I think it's bad, because I don't. It's just good, but that's it. So, how could I possibly think this way? I'll tell you after the story. A future version of Ed travels back in time to kill his present-day counterpart. Why? Because Cola is illegal in the future, and he'd rather die than have to go through that. I'm not gonna lie, that's actually pretty funny. But the rest of the episode is just them running away from future Ed with some jokes here and there. So, for the so-called greatest Ed's World episode ever, the plot is incredibly simple. <laughs> I should point out that this was the first and probably only big Ed's World episode that Ed wrote entirely on his own, and that's really cool. He keeps the story going, never losing focus of the main plot, and even though, again, it's really simple, he manages to keep it entertaining by throwing in some good jokes. They're not comedic gold or anything, but every single joke at least made me chuckle. The story as a whole, however, is the weakest part of the episode in my opinion. It's not terrible or anything, it has a good setup with good jokes to back it up, but considering this is an Ed's World episode involving time travel, it probably could have done more with the idea. Like maybe during a chase, future Ed accidentally brings the guys into the future with him. 
The closest we get to something like that is having future Tom and future Matt come to the present, but they don't really do anything. In all fairness, the ending more than takes advantage of the time travel aspect. I won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it, but it involves a character changing history using Future Ed's time travel device. It's a great moment, one that you would immediately think of when you put Ed's world and time travel together, but I just wish there were more moments like it. At least the animation is great. What the Future is probably the point where Ed's animation style started looking the best it's ever been. Maybe that's one reason why people think this is the best episode, and I guess I can understand that. I mean, it does look really good. The colors, the shading, the backgrounds, it's some of Ed's greatest. Although, I couldn't help but notice the tiny little white lines that keep appearing at certain times. Like he could have filled in those backgrounds completely, but didn't. So why is What the Future considered to be the best episode ever? Honestly, I don't have a clue. It feels like it could have been a bigger episode given the time travel aspect, but seems slightly confined to the present, and I guess it feels like a missed opportunity in that sense. However, the area where it more than succeeds is in the humor. This episode has some really good jokes, and personally, that's the only reason why I come back to this episode. They're not good enough to make it the best episode ever because I don't think the story is good enough to match. But stuff like Super Guy in the Laser and Matt's talking selfies are more than enough to bring me back. What the Future is a fun episode. Not great, but fun. This is one time warp I wouldn't mind doing again. So if you saw my last video, you'll know that I thought What the Future was just good. Hammer and Fail, on the other hand, is freaking great. The writing, the story, the comedy, the animation, everything works so well together that I'm surprised What the Future is still the more popular episode. I mean, come on, Hammer and Fail is just so much better. And I'm gonna tell you why, but first we have a story to summarize. Interestingly enough, Hammer and Fail is actually the first episode to be split into two parts, not counting the zombie attack and Santa Claus trilogies. In part one, Ed and the guys are running out of room in the house to keep all of Matt's junk, so they decide to add an extra floor to the house. But instead of hiring builders to do it for them, they just go ahead and build it themselves. Already that's a great setup. But once we get to part two, that's where things get even better. They decide to order a pre-built roof from a company that apparently has a problem with ghosts in their roofs, so now there's an evil spirit haunting their house and they have to chase it out. It changes gears from part one so quickly and yet it still somehow fits in and ties the story together brilliantly. Call it strange, but it reminds me a lot of Gravity Falls. An episode of Gravity Falls usually starts out with a basic setup like Mabel wanting to beat Pacifica at minigolf, but then reveals a bunch of minigolf elves that help her win, and then leads to a war between the elves to see which of them helped her the best. It takes what could have made for just a basic episode that might have gotten a few chuckles, and takes it in a completely different direction that ultimately makes the story a whole lot better. This is what I wanted from What the Future, a story that takes complete advantage of its setup. If it was just Ed, Matt, and Tom adding an extra floor to their house, you might get some good jokes out of it. But throw in the ghost, and of course Eduardo's gang, and you have a recipe for pure comedic gold. Which reminds me, Eduardo's gang is hilarious. They're just there to make the other guys feel bad, they hate each other because they drink different kinds of soda, it's just great. You know what else is great? The animation. This is some of my favorite animation in the entire show. I love this style. I love it so much that we're using it as the basis for the Ed's World fan movie. It has the right amount of simplicity, the right amount of over-the-top expressions, the right amount of movement and tweening. I don't think Ed really thought that hard about how he animated this episode, but it seems like he got lucky. The music is really good too, which I usually don't mention in these reviews, but here it's just, it's, it's just great. I love the montage song and the fight music, and of course... Flash 
Flashback! The composers they got to do this episode have a really good ear when it comes to finding the right vibe to go for with the music. Or maybe it was Ed asking for specific songs for specific scenes and going with the best stuff that he got. When music starts to play in a scene, it matches the tone that the scene conveys. You get funny music for a funny scene, epic music for an epic scene, and there's never a moment where it doesn't match at all. Everything works together perfectly, and that's what Hammer and Fail is like as a whole. I honestly can't think of anything bad to say about this episode, there are just too many great aspects of it. The writing, spot on. The animation, stellar. The music, perfect. This is pretty much the best Ed's World episode ever, aside from Movie Makers, but you already know why. If you haven't seen this episode, I highly recommend you check it out. You'll be hooked from beginning to end. Santa Claus 3, the final installment in the Santa Claus Trilogy. Normally, the third in a trilogy is considered to be the most lackluster. Hell, even the Zombie Attack trilogy is guilty of that. But the Santa Claus episodes are a rare case where the third one is actually the best. I'm serious. This episode is everything you would want it to be. It ends the story on the highest possible note. It gives us all the characters we'd want to see doing all the things we'd want them to do. And it throws a whole bunch of surprises at us. But I'm getting way ahead of myself, so let's take things slowly and start from the beginning. Tom's fed up with having to save Christmas all the time. Might I remind you that he absolutely hates Christmas. <clears throat> and so he wanders off into the woods where he comes across Xanta, now with a sleigh of his own. How did he survive getting crushed by a chandelier at the end of Santa Claus 2? Well, if he can survive getting punched into space, then he can survive anything. That and he's already dead, so it wouldn't have killed him anyway. So Xanta tries to get Tom to team up with him and destroy Christmas together, but Tom kicks him out of his sleigh and goes on a rampage of his own. Now, in an unexpected turn of events, Xanta has to help Ed, Matt, and even good old Kris Kringle himself to put an end to Tom's madness. I love this setup. Tom's definitely had the worst luck out of everyone in the whole trilogy, aside from Xanta getting crushed by the chandelier, but you know what I mean. He got a lousy gift from Santa at the end of Santa Claus 1, and his eyes got destroyed by a laser at the end of Santa Claus 2. So now, in Santa Claus 3, he's just tired of things not going his way, especially since it's always happened at Christmas time, and he decides to let his anger out in the most violent and destructive way you can imagine. And Tom goes nuts. He breaks into people's houses and tears everything apart, stomping on the tree and throwing decorations into the fireplace. We even see him blow up entire skyscrapers. Damn, he must really hate Christmas that much. And remember when I said Santa himself was one of the weakest parts of Santa Claus 2? Well, Santa Claus 3 completely makes up for that. When people ask me why Santa is one of my favorite characters in the show, all I have to do is show them this episode. This is the Xanta that I love watching. He's evil, but he's also kind of pathetic. He gets slayjacked and ends up crashing at Ed's place, even wearing what I assume is Tord's hoodie. Makes sense, considering Tord was his favorite. I also love Santa in this episode. He's clearly getting tired of the whole Christmas in danger thing, so now he's kind of apathetic and doesn't even bother thinking of a good plan to stop Tom. But when they do come up with a plan, it involves controlling a giant boxmas bot and fighting Tom head-on in the middle of the city. And what better music to accompany this sequence than Christmas Demolition? This is one of the best songs ever used in the entire show, and it plays during one of the best scenes in the entire show. It's an Ed's World climax up to 11, complete with Tom and Xanta beating each other up and playing dueling guitars. And the animation? Holy crap, this is some of Ed's best work yet! The characters are more expressive, the updated designs for both Santa and Xanta are spot on, the colors are wonderfully used, and I love the gradient effects used to give each setting its own atmosphere and mood. A foggy snowy night has a white and blue gradient. 
A house with a family by the fireplace has an orange and yellow gradient. Xanta's presence gives the living room in Ed's house a dark peach and green gradient. It all really just gives the episode an extra visual appeal that makes it stand out from any other. Now, are there things about this episode that I don't like? No, not really. I can't even find any things to nitpick. Everything about Santa Claus 3 is just so good that there's hardly anything worth complaining about. Much like Hammer and Fail, it's just a great episode. Not only is it the best in the Santa Claus trilogy, and not only is it my favorite Ed's World Christmas special, after watching it again, it's now one of my absolute favorite Ed's World episodes of all time. Movie Makers is still at the top of my nice list, but Santa Claus 3 is pretty close behind. On Sunday, March 25th, 2012, Ed Gould, the creator of Ed's World, sadly passed away after a six-year-long battle with cancer. For Ed's World fans, it was a very sad day, and it left us asking ourselves, what's going to happen to the show? Fortunately, it was revealed that through a fundraiser called Ed's World Legacy, new episodes would continue to be produced, with Tom serving as producer and Paul Trevord as the new head of animation. With this new era of Ed's World, things like the animation, the writing, and the characters would be going through some big changes. And Space Face is where the show made that transition. In this two-part episode, the plot revolves around Ed, Matt, and Tom getting abducted by aliens. They're led by Commander Bai, who tells them that they used their vanity to power their ship. But after it broke down, they got fatter and fatter until they couldn't use their self-esteem to get back home. So they decide to use Matt as their fuel source because no one else in the world could possibly be as vain as him. This is one of the cleverest, most original setups for an Ed's World episode I've seen in years. But the writing as a whole has a few faults to it that I noticed even when this episode first came out. First off, when the aliens see how much Matt can be of use to them, they just decide to dump him and the guys off through the garbage disposal bay. Why? He's your only chance at getting home, and you're just gonna throw him away? Is it because his vanity is too powerful and you're worried that he'll send you off course? I guess that makes sense, but you still need that power. They probably didn't even think of that because they were apparently dumb enough to get themselves sucked into space. They might have been attractive before, but they're not exactly the brightest stars in the galaxy. Second, is it me, or does Tom just have a few too many lines? Ed, of course, sadly passed away before this episode was released, so I just assume that most of Tom's lines, specifically in Part 2, were written for Ed, but given to him at the last second. I bring this up because near the end of the episode, Ed says this. You've been pretty quiet today, Tom. That line doesn't make any sense in the context of the episode, because Tom was anything but quiet throughout the whole thing. He even had more lines than Ed did, so the line about Tom being quiet makes even less sense. Speaking of which, because of Ed's death, his character had to be given a new voice, and it was given to him by filmmaker Tim Howdekeet. Before Part 2 came out, I watched a lot of his videos just out of curiosity, and I quickly became a pretty big fan of his. So when Part 2 was finally released, it was really weird hearing his voice coming out of Ed's mouth. But I liked that they went with someone that fans of Ed's world, or even fans of Tom, weren't entirely familiar with. And looking back, I kinda think the choice of Tim makes sense. He really has this strange quality to him that Ed had, where even when he doesn't put that much effort into his performance, it still works. Unfortunately, he doesn't get to shine that much here, but from what I've heard, I think he's a suitable replacement. How about the animation? Ed wasn't able to finish Space Face before his death, so the rest of it was given to Paul. He is without a doubt one of the greatest living animators out there, and I'm not just saying that because we're friends. His skills are unbelievable, and the work he did for Part 2 is just outstanding. For Part 1, however, it's just as great, but since the first two-thirds of it were done in Ed's style, the transition into Paul's style seems a bit clunky. 
As soon as they reach the helm, the characters suddenly have these smoother outlines and are drawn in a drastically different art style. It looks fantastic, don't get me wrong, but it just kinda bothers me how it doesn't match the rest of the episode. Again, this is just for part one. If it was done to look closer to Ed style and then Date Night was used as a transition to the new style, that would have been fine. But as it is, it's a bit annoying that it changes so suddenly, but both Ed and Paul did a really good job. One thing I probably should mention is the music. Space Face introduces two dedicated composers to the Legacy season. You have Lando for part one, and Todd Bryanton for part two. Yoav's music has his traditional electronic sound, while Todd's is very orchestral. I like both, I don't really prefer one over the other, and their stuff here is great. But if I had to pick which one I found more memorable, I'd probably go with Yoav's music. It's less atmospheric and more melodic, so yeah. On the whole, Space Face is an awkward but decent transition into the Legacy season, and as an Ezreal episode, it's still pretty enjoyable. It has its flaws in terms of story, but you can get through it okay. With great animation, epic music, and a cute sense of humor, this would only be the start for a whole new era in the Ed's World Legacy. Now let me start by answering your first question. No, I didn't forget about Date Night. It was a short that came out in between Space Face Parts 1 and 2, and I decided to skip it for this retrospective because there isn't much about it that's worth giving it its own video. But if you want to know what my thoughts on it are, it's a Tom Ska video with an Ed's World skin, and the only thing that makes it worth watching is the animation. Not that I hate it or anything, I just wasn't really that amazed by it. Fortunately, the Snogger is nothing like Date Night. It's still nothing spectacular, but I definitely found it more enjoyable and closer to Ed's World standards. A plane piloted by Paul, and a character I'm choosing not to mention out of respect for the person this character is based on, crashes into a cloudberg and drops a barrel of toxic waste onto a snowman that Tom made. I'm guessing the cloudberg is the offspring of the iceberg and one of the smoke clouds from climate change. I don't know how reproduction would work in those circumstances, but that's beside the point. The toxic waste brings the snowman to life, turning it into a monster that spits purple ooze that can bring other snowmen to life. Then there's a bunch of snowmats that speak in recycled audio from Space Face. I love your hair! Nice. I can tell hey, handsome! They go into a store that sells fireplaces and then melt. Then before the snowger can slay Ed and Matt, Tom comes in piloting a CDT-01 tank covered in snow and blasts it. But this causes toxic waste to infect people and turn them into zombies, and then the credits roll. Both Date Night and The Snogger are what I classify as filler episodes. Nothing too special, nothing really big or plot-driven, only really existing to hold people over until the bigger episodes come out. But while Date Night was more of a distraction to keep people tuned in for Space Face Part 2, The Snogger is pretty much a teaser trailer for Fun Dead. We see how the zombies are created, and they even put in a little advertisement for it at the end. If that was the whole point of getting this episode made, then... Well, it's a neat little teaser, but as episodes go, I found it a little lacking. At least it feels more like an Ed's World episode than Date Night. This feels like it was meant to be an Ed's World episode first, instead of a scrapped Tom Ska video reworked into an Ed's World episode. And one thing it fixes from Space Face that I really appreciate is how it gives each of the characters an equal amount of focus. Although I still think Tom gets a little too much compared to Ed, it doesn't bother me as much as it did in Space Face. Even Tim gets a couple more things to say this time, and I think he's settling into the role of Ed just fine here. The best part of the episode is undoubtedly the animation. I will continue to praise Paul's work until I'm dead, and he definitely deserves it here. It's not perfect, however, because there are times when you see the characters have four fingers in one shot, but then they have five in another. Also, for what's supposed to be a crudely drawn tank, that tank sure looks pretty well drawn. Still, those are totally minor nitpicks, since everything else looks great. 
the designs, the movement, the backgrounds, the colors, it's distinctly Paul's style, but it still has Ed's World qualities to it. As for Todd's musical score, it sounds great, but I can't really remember any of it. Though his cameo as the singing snowman is pretty funny. Magical snowman. When the Snogger first came out, I liked it enough. It was nice to get some more Ed's World content after the Legacy season got off to a rocky start, and it was entertaining enough for me. Nowadays, however, I don't find myself going back to it that often anymore. After rewatching it for this review, I still liked it, but it didn't leave a lasting impact on me as much as Hammer and Fail or even shorts like Fanservice did. It's decent filler and it has great animation, but now that Fun Dead's been out for more than three years, the magic we got from seeing it teased here is pretty much gone. But overall, is the Snogger still enjoyable? Yes. And even if it's not quite as exciting as Space Face, does that mean you should avoid it at all costs? Snow way. Okay, so Date Night and the Snogger were the first filler episodes of the Legacy season, and Hide and Seek proves that they weren't gonna be the last. Now, I understand that mentally, Tom was in a pretty rough place during Legacy, so I'm not gonna blindly hate on his work because it isn't Hammer and Fail or Movie Makers. I'm gonna try my best to give each episode a critical but fair and respectful analysis. Keyword being try. So, what's the story here? Matt wants to play Hide and Seek. Yeah. Ed and Tom play along, but decide to watch TV instead. Okay, that's pretty funny. Matt meets a bunch of food creatures and has to fight a giant burrito ranosaurus. Wait, what? Tom opens the fridge and finds that Matt locked himself inside. Um, well, this was a thing. One thing I noticed about a couple Legacy episodes is that they'll have interesting setups, yet they don't seem to take complete advantage of those setups, and Hide and Seek is no exception. I don't know if it had something to do with pressure or time constraints on the Legacy team's part, but what you see is what you get. I'm not calling the story terrible or anything, but nothing extraordinary happens. Not even Matt's fight with the Burrito Ranosaurus. It's cute, but we don't see much of it, and it ends really quickly. The stuff with the food creatures in general is at best harmless, even if Tom providing their voices is incredibly distracting. Maybe it would have been more interesting if the fridge was actually a Narnia-style gateway to this other world, and Ed and Tom happened to go inside to see that Matt was made king after killing the Burrito Ranosaurus. Then another Burrito Ranosaurus would come, and they would all have to kill it, or something like that. There's a lot more that can be done with the stuff that's here. It's totally fine on its own, and the scenes with Matt are very enjoyable, although this could have made for a really fun episode with a level of weirdness equal to something like spares or climate change. But instead, we get what's basically an excuse for Tom to tell us how much he doesn't like Doctor Who. While Matt's off doing his thing, Ed and Tom are sitting on the couch watching a show that's obviously a parody of Doctor Who, and they get more and more bored by it. I get why Tom would be bored by it, but why Ed? It doesn't make sense for him to not like it when Ed himself was a Doctor Who fan in real life. I don't have a problem with the characters being separated from their real-life counterparts, but if this is supposed to be for comedy, then having both Ed and Tom be bored by it isn't quite as funny. You could have Ed enjoy it and want to keep watching, but Tom might want to switch to something else, and you could have them fighting for a while and cause them to forget about Matt locking himself in the fridge. That would be funny, especially if Matt stays there long enough to grow a beard or something, putting more emphasis on how long he'd be there and how long Ed and Tom would be fighting for. Like with the Snogger, the only thing about Hide and Seek that I would consider to be great is the animation. It was done by Tobias Nitt, and it's the closest any Legacy episode got to replicating Ed's style without actually trying to replicate Ed's style. Outlines are smooth, movement is fluent, backgrounds are nice, and the subtle changes made to the character designs are quite clever. Matt's obsessed with his look, so it would make sense for him to do his hair up like that or keep the strings on his hoodie at an equal length. I like this, as I find it incorporates more of the characters' personalities into their looks. But, with all due respect, apart from some of the scenes with Matt, 
The animation is really the only reason why I would want to go back to this one. Hide and Seek isn't a completely terrible episode, I just find it a little bland, even for a short. I didn't even mention the music, which Todd does a good job with, even though I swear he recycles some music from Space Face on the Snogger. The story and the comedy are a little lacking to me, and while I, as a Whovian, can respect that Tom doesn't like the show, the jabs at Doctor Who just come up as a bit forced, unneeded, and honestly kind of make me wonder if Tom's ever seen the show at all. So, as a whole, Hide and Seek is okay. It probably could have been done a little better, but I think it's decent enough to satisfy your Ed's World cravings. Finally, we get to- Hey, that's me! I'm a zombie! And so is Billy. Oops, sorry, got distracted. <clears throat> Finally, we get to Fun Dead. This was one of the most anticipated episodes to come out during the Legacy season. It was the first big Legacy episode to come out, the first big zombie episode since Zombie Attack 3, and the first time we got a complete feel for Paul's style. It took a long time to come out as well, which added to the hype. So, when it was finally uploaded, almost a full year after the Snogger, was Fun Dead worth the wait? Actually, yeah. In fact, out of all the episodes that were made during Ed's World Legacy, Fun Dead is probably the best one. Sometime after the events of the Snogger, a huge zombie infestation has begun. But that's not stopping Ed and the guys from going to a new theme park in town called Asdif Land. When they get there, it takes a while for them to realize that the park is absolutely filled with zombies, and the rest of the episode is them trying to get out alive. In terms of writing, Fun Dead is the closest that Legacy's gotten to replicating the feel of an older Ed's World episode. There's a story there, but it focuses a little more on the jokes, which is pretty much how Ed would have written an episode. And even the jokes are a bit closer to Ed's sense of humor as well. The only gags I can think of that don't quite match up are when the TV tells Ed to stop interrupting him, and when Ed and Matt encounter a zombified YouTube commenter. I don't know, something about those moments feel more like Tom jokes than Ed jokes. But the writing as a whole has a perfect mix of the newer legacy style of storytelling and Ed's style of storytelling. It's a newer episode that feels like an older episode, and it works. I also love the idea of it taking place in a theme park. You've got zombies on roller coasters, zombies in claw machines, zombies in an arcade. It's a really fun location to put zombies in, and the parts where they come in are all the more entertaining. Fun Dead also gives Ed a few more lines than he had in previous episodes. He had some things to say here and there, but this episode gives Tim a bigger chance to shine. And at this point, it sounds like he's still trying to get settled into the role, but I think he does a great job. Tom thankfully doesn't get too much focus this time, and on that subject, the focus on all three of them is balanced out a lot better than in Space Face and the Snogger. Each of the guys get an equal amount of attention, and as such, Fun Dead feels more like an episode that's about all of them, as opposed to just one of them. The animation is absolutely fantastic. After Space Face Part 2, Date Night, and the Snogger, this is the first full episode that Paul got to animate on his own and it does not disappoint. Everything moves so fluently, everything is drawn so well, everything is detailed so impeccably, and Paul even gets a bit experimental by incorporating elements of anime and comic books and even his own style. It's not how Ed would have done it, but I can look past it when the animation is this good. The music is equally great too. Living Tombstone's work is just what I'd come to expect from Ed's world music. It's very catchy and has a killer sound to it. Todd's music is good too, but like in Space Face and the Stoger, it's more atmospheric and not quite as memorable. You wouldn't even be able to tell that some of his music here is even recycled from the Stoger. I love the orchestral sound and it's very well made, but I just prefer Living Tombstone's work here. When Tom and his crew took over the show in 2012, this is what I've been wanting to see for every single episode. Something that has great writing and great animation, and feels both old and new at the same time. 
Not that every episode before or after this one is bad, but Fun Dead is a legitimately great episode. I love the setup, I enjoy the humor, everything is balanced out remarkably well, and it's just plain fun to watch. We had to sit through a bunch of filler to get here, but in the end, we were delivered with not just the best episode in the entire season, but one of the best episodes in the entire series. So, Fun Dead was released sometime in February 2014, and after it was so greatly anticipated, how do Tom and his team follow up on it? Would they give us another lackluster filler episode like Hide and Seek? Or would they give us something equally as good as Fun Dead? Well, a couple months later, we got Power Ed, which ended up kind of being a mix of both. Power Ed is a superhero episode. Eduardo, now voiced by a different actor, installs a nuclear-powered satellite dish on the roof of his house, just as Ed is fixing a problem with his satellite dish. After a freak accident, both of them are given superpowers rather than be infected with radiation poisoning, which is what would realistically happen. But of course, this episode is about superheroes, so realism is not of the utmost importance here. Ed uses his newfound abilities to become Power Ed, and since every great hero needs a villain, Eduardo emerges as Numero Uno. The two of them throw down Captain America Civil War style, and aside from the climax, nothing major really happens in this story. We see Ed mess around with his powers and make a costume, but then it goes right into him fighting Eduardo. And speaking of Eduardo, we never see what he does when he finds out he has powers. He gets zapped in the opening, and then shows up right before the climax takes place just to give Ed something superhero-y to do. I guess I could say it seems rushed in that sense, but at the same time, it actually has a decent pace. It flows very naturally, and scenes transition into each other really nicely. It even goes a little deeper into Ed and Eduardo's past. Although, I can't lie, I think it's funnier when Eduardo has a less significant reason to hate Ed. But what they do with him here makes sense and is perfectly credible. I got so excited when I heard that Ed's world was going to be doing a superhero episode. There were just so many things they could do with the idea. And while I'm fine with what was given, I can't help but feel like Power Ed comes off as a bit of a missed opportunity. Instead of having two characters be given superpowers, how much more exciting would it have been to make it a team standoff? Like an Avengers vs Justice League kind of story with a superpowered Ed, Matt, and Tom going against a superpowered Eduardo, Mark, and John. It's refreshing to get an Ed's World episode that's actually about Ed for a change, but why did he and Eduardo have to be the only ones to get superpowers? We do get a scene where Tom turns into a monster, but that doesn't add anything. It's weirdly animated too, since it wasn't made clear if Eduardo's laser came down to hit him or if he was hit by the laser while he was in the air. There are a lot of things that could have been done with the idea of Ed's World tackling superheroes, but because it does so little in so little time, it ultimately leaves me just a touch bit disappointed. The animation, on the other hand, is great. Anthony Price is to thank for making it look so good, and it really does look so good. At first I thought the style was a bit too pointy, but the more I went back to this episode, the more it started growing on me. It's a very action-oriented episode, so an animation style like this would be needed. It also gives it a bit of an edge, which not many other episodes have had. Anthony Price is one of my favorite legacy animators because of this. I'd love to see more episodes in this style. Although, in keeping with presentation, I'm completely split about the music. Todd definitely captures the feel of a superhero movie, but again, like with his other scores, I don't find it very memorable unless it's sampling the Ed's World theme for about the 6th or 7th time in the whole episode. If there was anything about the music that I didn't like, it's how many times it incorporates the Ed's World jingle. Todd uses it a lot in this episode, and while it's not a major flaw that ruins the whole thing, I still found it a little annoying. 
Come to think of it, there are a lot of small things about Power Red that bother me. I still don't know what's up with that Tom monster. Brock Baker as Eduardo is really distracting since I was a fan of his before he took over. And for a show that's supposed to have a timeless value to it, it sure doesn't seem to have a problem with throwing Nick Fury in there. There's also a joke about someone committing suicide that seems a touch too dark for Ed's world standards. And sure, you can come at me saying, what about the milkman driving off the cliff in Santa Claus 1? Well, the reason why it worked in that episode is because he's killing himself for a silly and ridiculous reason, that being Ed not thanking him for sending a Christmas card. The joke is that he's getting worked up and going to these extremes over something so trivial. In Power Ed, we don't know why this guy wants to kill himself. It could be depression, his life could be falling apart, maybe he's going through a divorce, it could be anything. But I'm nitpicking way too much about this. In the end, these are all just that. Oh dear. In the end, these are all just that. Nitpicks. As a whole, I still enjoyed Power Ed. I wouldn't say it's as good as Fun Dead, but I liked it all the same. It has a good story with some nice character moments, some great animation, and while I can't listen to Eduardo's voice without thinking of Brock Baker, I think he's a good replacement for Chris O'Neill. I still find parts of Power Ed to be a little disappointing, but for what it is, I had a good time with it. Grab your super suit and go see what you're missing. I'll just get right to it. Mirror Mirror is not a very big episode. The Legacy season has a lot of shorter episodes that could come off as nothing but filler for the bigger episodes, and Mirror Mirror is a very similar case. Now don't get me wrong, I like this one. Matilda is one of the most adorable things ever conceived in the entire show. And the rest of the episode is good too, but with a premise like this, I really wish it was expanded on a little more. You'll see why after I summarize the plot. Mirror Mirror is a genderbend episode. Matt buys a mirror from a magic shop, and on the other side is a different universe where the guys are all girls. So instead of Ed, Tom, and Matt, we get Elle, Tamara, and Matilda. They also buy a mirror from a magic shop, but Tamara also gets a free box from this guy who's obviously not Walter White from Breaking Bad. Again, way to deliver on that timeless value. When she opens it, it releases a genie named Dazim, who zaps at them until they throw a sword at him and make him disappear. That's it. Yeah, it's just like Hide and Seek, it doesn't get any deeper than that. And sadly, just like Power Ed, it feels like a missed opportunity. It's cool to see the guys as girls, especially since Elle is voiced by Ed's sister Vicky, which is a very nice touch. But why couldn't we see them going into the mirror to meet the girls? Imagine the kind of interactions you could get from seeing Matt and Matilda, or Tom and Tamara together. Imagine if the genie broke loose and started attacking the town, and then the guys and girls would have to stop him. That's one of the big reasons why we did Best of Both Worlds, because I thought the idea of Ed, Matt, and Tom meeting their female counterparts had a lot of potential. But nah, we'll just spend some time in the guy's world, then spend some time in the girl's world, and not really do much else with the idea. I do enjoy the voice acting, as I feel that the actresses who played the girls are all good choices, and it's cool to hear Tim voice another character aside from Ed as he provides the voice of Dazim. I'm just disappointed that we don't get to see them do a whole lot of stuff. That being said, I think the animation makes up for it. Sandra Rivas was put in charge of this one, and having the episode be in her style was a good choice. It has a kind of bouncy Nickelodeon look and feel to it, but it doesn't stray too far away from the Ed's World style. It still looks like Ed's World, it just happens to have characters that look and move a little differently. Even when judging it on its own, I think this is one of the best looking legacy episodes so far, just for the simplicity and overall appeal. I'm not really fond of the music, however. It's well constructed and it fits the episode fine, but just like most of Todd's other scores, it's not exactly memorable. This problem is persistent throughout a majority of the legacy season, but I think it's at its worst here. Not that it's terrible, but I just would have preferred if the music incorporated catchier melodies. 
Music didn't always play a huge part in the show's history, but when there was music, it was the kind that you could listen to outside of the show and still enjoy. Todd's music, while again well made, isn't something I can listen to while I'm working or going for a walk. But both the music and the episode itself do serve the same purpose, to exist. Mirror Mirror isn't very substantial, and although it's not terrible, watching it doesn't compel me to go back to it at a later time. It's just... cute. It has a cute story, cute jokes, cute animation, and that's all it is, but that's absolutely fine. If you want an Ed's World episode that's cute, but not too big or exciting, this'll get the job done. It just might be worth a second glance. <laughs> 